We thought about making the letter A for the Arkansas River, which is one of the reasons Tulsa is located where it is. But on a warm August night, we decided to join the crowd at the city's last remaining drive-in movie theater. A is for Admiral Twin. Three kids, two adults. All right, 20 bucks. Blake Smith is the owner and the operator. This is my 22nd year. Next year will be our 60th anniversary. It's really an institution in Tulsa. I think the main reason people like it so much is it's really old fashioned. I'm usually one of the first ones at the gate. I have my spot. <laughs> yes, I have my spot. I like front row, dead center. And it's like almost every other weekend now we come out here, watch movies, throw a mattress in the back of the truck, just chill out. It gives kids that have grown up here the opportunity to bring their kids out or their grandkids out. And it's something you don't find a lot. This is a place where if you've got a husband that doesn't really like a crowd, you can bring him out here and he can have his cigarettes, put his feet up. We prefer the liquor stay at home, folks. You'll see people all the time out here that you'll run into them the next week. It becomes like a family situation and, you know, a kind of a tradition for us. There is a lot of tradition here. The place opened with a single screen known as the Modern Air. When the second screen was added, it was renamed the Admiral Twin. There's so much money in the wood. Bob Keith is a projectionist who has worked out here for years. It was the highest grossing drive in the Southwest for years. We would line cars up here, pa pack the shows, and still have cars out to Admiral Boulevard. You could buy, I mean, it was like a restaurant. You could buy almost anything you wanted. And people came out and ate dinner before they saw the movie. The drive-in appeared in the 1983 film, The Outsiders, starring Matt Dillon and Rob Lowe. In one scene, characters sneak into the drive-in under this fence. The other night we had a, a family from Pittsburgh. The mom said we drove all the way from Pittsburgh. That's what my daughter, who was like 14 or something, she wanted to come as her favorite movie. She wanted to see Tulsa. She wanted to see specifically the Admiral Twin Drive-In where they snuck in underneath the, the fence over here, which is still there. I still have the spot, it's still open. You could still climb under it, but I leave poison ivy around it, so you'll pay for it like the next day. We snuck inside one of the two projection booths and found Kent Hall, who keeps all this vintage equipment running. We've got mostly uh, World War II vintage projector heads, which are rebuilt on a regular basis every three to five years. As long as you take care of it, keep it clean, it will last forever. As for me, myself, this is the first place I ever saw a movie. I saw The Jungle Book way back when it came out as a cartoon originally. I came here with 70 different boyfriends in 35 years, probably five to 10 boyfriends a year. <laughs> okay, with that, let's move on and head down to the Brady District on the north edge of downtown, which gets its name from Tate Brady, an early shaker and mover. Uh, kind of one of those early. ORU history professor Paul Vickery Story. met us at the corner of Brady and Cincinnati to give us some background. Well, I think Tate Brady was perhaps one of the most important figures in early Tulsa. His goal was to make Tulsa one of the jewels of the Midwest. As one of the first merchants in the city, Mr. Brady had a sign out front promising a dollar's worth of honest goods for one dollar. He also built one of the city's first hotels and organized booster trips where city leaders would take trains to big cities back east to convince people to move here. One of the things that he would say is uh, when he brought, went around on these train ventures was, uh, come on everybody, get off the grass. We're from the home of natural gas, Indian territory, and don't give a rap. So move to Tulsa and get on the map. That was his goal, to bring people and publicity to Tulsa. With his wealth, Mr. Brady built a nice mansion for his family in one of the city's ritziest parts of town back then, North Denver overlooking downtown. It was here at his home in 1925 that Mr. Brady shot and killed himself in the kitchen after learning his son died in a traffic accident. The mansion has had different owners since. 
So B is for Tate Brady and all the things around here named for him. Just as we did B with Tate Brady, I think C should be the Canes Ballroom. The historic Canes Ballroom is worth consideration. After all, Bob Wills put it on the map in the 1930s with his Western Swing, and the place is still going today. But we're going back even further in time. At 18th and Cheyenne is the Council Oak Tree that marks the spot where the Creek Indians gathered when they first arrived here in the 1800s. A.D. Ellis is chief of the Creeks. The Lidjibuga people, you know, came on the Trail of Tears and they brought the ashes from the old fire in, in Alabama and they were looking for a place here and they found this oak tree atop this hill and they started the new fire here and had the first council meeting here. So this was their new home in, in Indian Territory. To me it's very important because my ancestors were the ones that settled here and uh, it's just a, a sacred place to us. Rob Tripp's ancestors were members of the Creek Lachiboga tribe. The tree is not the sacred spot. The tree is just a landmark that tells us where that sacred spot was. Actually, it was right over here near the crest of this hill uh, where these apartments are today. That would have been where the ceremonial fire was kept. So it's not only Tulsa's first religious place, it was also the seat of their town government. There's a monument next to the council oak tree explaining the significance of this ancient meeting spot. And once a year, there's a celebration of sorts here to remember the Trail of Tears and the importance of this area. I want Tulsans to know all of Tulsa's history. It did not start at statehood. There's a long history of this place that goes way back and people should know and understand that. It's hard to find much around here that has withstood the test of time like the council oak tree. But not too far away is a whimsical and historical building, the Art Deco Riverside Studio. And every weekend since the 1950s, people have been flocking here to watch a quirky theatrical production. We're making D for the drunkard. It's uh, the flavor of uh, American theater from way back. Like the old saying goes, it's the most fun I ever had with my clothes on. <laughs> I enjoy it, and I love to make people laugh, and I get a chance to do that. The first time I watched it was on my birthday, and I left laughing like crazy. I just thought it was the best thing I'd ever seen. A lot of people have seen The Drunkard since it's been playing on this stage since 1953. The show is a melodrama performed as it would have been done in beer gardens a hundred years ago. The storyline of The Drunkard is about the evils of, well, getting drunk. The Drunkard is basically about a man who is a drunkard and his daughter goes in the bar room every night to come and get him. We know who the good guy is and who the bad guys are and you root for the good guys and you boo and hiss the bad guys. That's right, the audience is actually encouraged to interact with the characters on stage. This is a participating play. You're not just supposed to sit back and not make a word. It's not that serious a play. Normally you have to be quiet in a play, and in this one you don't. You can just yell at us and we don't even really mind. One of the worst audiences we ever had was a bunch of doctors, and I believe they just thought it was beneath their dignity to relax and, uh, <laughs> and laugh. I wondered if she wouldn't have me. <laughs> I play the villain tonight. I play Harvey Green, the gambler and the villain, which is a very cathartic experience. Because you can never, you can rarely overact Harvey Green. I mean, he's just rotten to the core. Since the drunkard has been rollicking along most weekends since 1953, they say it's the world's longest continuous running play. Uh, we, we still work real hard at being a G-rated family show. The principal thing I think that has kept it going on for all these years is the fact that it's so unique. You won't find anything like this anywhere else. We have uh, at least four different casts. Uh, not one cast does it every single Saturday night. Of course, this building is the Bruce Goff treasure. I mean, we've been on the National Register of Historic Buildings since 2001. 